Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Bodleian's Western Library for Special Collections. It's my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Mahru Musavi, who took her PhD in 2019 in architectural history at the School of Architecture, Design and Planning, the University of Sydney. She teaches in the areas of art and architectural history of early modern Iran and the arts of the book. Her research is concerned with the parallel readings of art, architecture and literature. Dr. Musavi has been a Bihari Fellow in the Persian Arts of the Book at the Bodleian Library in this academic year, examining epistolary texts produced by the Safavids, the subject of her lecture tonight. Many of you will know the scope and extent of Persian collections that are held in the Bodleian Library. The Bihari Fellowships, advertised every October, invite scholars each year to extend their research through examination of these. Later this year, a British Academy grant will sponsor a conference and exhibition convened by Dr. Musavi on the subject of early modern Persian compilations. Uh, and it's now going to be our pleasure to listen to the lecture, Mahru. Thanks uh, very much. Dr. Franklin for the kind introduction and thanks everyone for uh, attending the lecture today. So I would like to begin this lecture with my most sincere thanks to every member of the Bodleian Libraries whose unwavering support has enormously warmed my heart and motivated me across these intense yet delightful past months that I held the Bahari Fellowship. My special thanks go to Richard Ovenden, Bodley's librarian, Alexandra Franklin, coordinator of the Center for the Study of the Book, and Alistair Watson, curator of Persian collections. I should also thank Rachel Naismith, administrative mm -hmm. assistant for visiting scholars, and all the librarians at the Western Library who have kindly, generously, and patiently helped and advised me. I would also like to express my deepest gratitude to the late Abadullah Bahari. His passion and compassion for Persian art, literature, and culture is a warming and guiding light for me and for the entire field of Iranian studies. The Persian chancellery writings of the late 14th to late 15th centuries of the Ilkhanid and Timurid courts, also the personal letter correspondence of the time, was mainly in simple, fluent, and precise language, devoid of rhetorical devices. This attitude, which was in some manners the effect of the early Mongols' tendency towards the simplicity of language, can be seen in many letters, such as those of the Ilkhanid Vazir Rashid al Din Fazlullah or Muhammad ibn Hindushah Nakhjavani, known as Shams Munshi, in his seminal work of Persian tarassul and epistolography called Dastur al Katib fi Ta'in al Maratib. Also, from the important personal and friendly correspondence of the time called Ikhwaniyat, it's worth mentioning the name of Abu Bakr ibn Zaki al Sadr, who was attached to the court of the Saljurs of Rome and compiled the late 13th century Rosatul Kutab wa Hadiratul Albab. From the late fifteenth century, however, we witness a gradual yet clear shift in the style of writing. Abdullah Marwarid's Munshaat or Sharaf Name and Qiyasuddin Khwandami's Name Nami of the first half of the 16th century, parallel to the Persian epistolography practiced at the court of the Mughals of India, such as Riyazul Insha of Khaja Muhammad Gawan, the Bahmani Wazir, and Badayul Insha or Insha Yusufi by Hakim Yusufi, the Munshi of Humayun, are evidence to this phenomenon. 
The classic traditional scholarship considered this shift as a process of decline. <coughs> Amongst many, Bahar, for example, in his seminal work, Sabkshan Asi, calls this a deterioration of style that became more obvious later in the works of the Safavid Munshis in the 16th and 17th centuries. In the Safavid epistles, and I quote, formal correspondence between personalities of equal rank or from an inferior to superior usually began with a long introduction called Eftetah in Arabic, in which the full name of the addressee was preceded by a long chain of titles, al qab epithets, no'ut, and detailed benedictory formulas, du'a and salam. Sometimes a letter might open with poetry in Arabic or Persian, designed to eulogize the addressee, characterize the writer's feelings, or prefigure the contents. The text, Mat, was full of Arabic expressions, quotations from the Quran and Hadith, and difficult words used synonymously and in rhymed and cadenced sentences. The meaning was often obscured by verbosity, recondite, and far-fetched figures of speech. What could be said in a few lines was extended to much greater length with repeated interruptions for Arabic and Persian verses. A similar trend may be observed even in friendly and informal letters written by educated people. As very good examples of such texts, we can refer to Hussein Waiz Kashafi's Mahzanul Insha, also Taskaratul Muluk, an important technical text on the Safavid administration system that is translated and edited by Minorsky. With this introduction, this paper revisits the problematic of the extreme complexity of the Safavid epistolography, either in the form of the courtly or personal and friendly correspondence. Is this abstruseness and fetishization of the Safavid text a phenomenon of the so-called stylistic dilemma, as is suggested by some scholars, or is it a deliberate and consistent textual mechanism fashioned and performed by the community of the Safavid literati and the adibs? And in this case, what did possibly the Safavid adibs plot to signify by the intricate abstruseness of the text or in which bigger picture the social psychology of this professional deliberation might be situated. To investigate such concerns, during the course of my Bahari fellowship in the Persian arts of the book, I have been able to visit several Monsha'at manuscripts that are currently housed at the special collections of the Bodleian Libraries, University of Oxford, of which 15 of them, mainly in Shah manuscripts of the 16th to 18th centuries, are more central to my study. Some of these monsha'at are known in terms of the authors or the compiler or to whom the book is dedicated, and some others are anonymous. To create more consistency across this paper, I have narrowed down the range of texts that I would refer to as examples to four Bodleian monsha'at. Amongst these four, I have selected two known, or almost known, and two anonymous monsha'at, mainly to emphasize the significance of such namely humble manuscripts that are worth much more scholarly attention in this field. <coughs> these four selected monsha'at mainly constitute a set of Safavid courtly and personal epistles, of which I will try to limit the scope mainly to the personal and friendly letters called Echvaniyat. Firstly, the Gulshan Enayat, written in 1662 by Enayatullah and compiled by Muhammad Saleh Kambu. Secondly, a majmua of personal letters, mainly by Nasirai Hamedani, the well-known late 16th, early 17th century scholar and author of the Safavid period. Thirdly, an important monsha'at majmua of the Safavid period, compiled by an anonymous person, probably in mid to late 17th century. And fourthly, another anonymous insha and a manual on insha and monshigari, which is a scribal, of the mid-16th century called Latayful Ensha, and this is indeed 
different to the famous Latayf al and Shah of uh, Nasrullah Nasafi of the 14th century. I will argue that the emerging and unusual complexity of text during the Safavid period from the 16th to the 18th century is a phenomenon that occurs simultaneously across the different media and multiple forms of textuality. This would best and foremost include the poetry of the Safavids, also the practice of architectural epigraphy, of which only the former is within the scope of this paper. This simultaneous shift towards extreme complexity and abstruseness of text defines and signals a fundamentally distinctive character for the very notion of early modern Persian textuality, elevating the agency of text from a signifier to self-reference signifier, or in other words, the signified itself, reinforcing and presenting the early modern practice of adab that flourished in the Safavid context. This shift in the characterization and systematization of text marks a crucial point in time in the literary history of Iran, a point that will possibly be missed from the lens of single disciplinarity. This study for most emphasizes the necessity of examining different forms of literary productions of text, such as prose and poetry, in parallel to and in resonance with each other. I begin with the Munshawat of Gulshan Enayat, a set of courtly and personal letters written by Enayatullah and compiled by his brother or friend, the well known Muhammad Saleh Kambu, in 1662. According to the colophon, the Bodleian copy is completed in 1688 in Shah Jahanabad. After the first few diplomatic letters written um, composed by Enayatullah, the Munshaat includes several shorter letters that are mainly personal correspondence between two individuals. To give you some background, let's read a few lines from some of these letters. And um, I should mention that uh, in some cases I have to read the original Persian text, but indeed the English translation is included beside it. به یکی از اهبای حس نگارش یافت جمال شاهد مقصود در خلوت کده امید دل مشتاقانه جلو فرمای جاوید باد ارتقاء مدارک شوق و طی مراحل آرزومندی به مرقات اندیشه و پای خیال نزد خرد محال پسند دشوارگزین متعبر بلکه متعذر است خامه کفید زبان اگر در صدد بیان بندی از لوایج اشتیاق و شداید هرمان و فراغ آید چون بلحوسان خام تمه و بلفوزولان زیاد سر در آرزوی امر محال سرگردان صحرای خسارت شده باشد. بیان شوق ندانستم که تا چند است جز اینقدر که دلم سخت آرزومند است. Or this example. به پردهدار حریم محبت و بساطارای بزم اخوت قلمی شد. These lines are good samples or representatives of a style of the 16th and 17th centuries Persian epistolography with clear illustration of the extreme complexity and mastery of textual composition and the minute application of layers of figures of speech and rhetorical devices. Similar to the chancellery writings, these Ikhwani letters reached the highest degree of complexity, firstly in the choice of vocabulary and secondly in the synthesis of meaning. The choice of words, concepts and images in the two epistles that I just read from Golshan and Ayat, and we also see in many other instances of the 16th and 17th centuries Tarasol, is mainly an amalgamation of two phenomena. Firstly, the vocabulary and concepts of the medieval Sufi Persian literature, and by this I also and mainly refer to the language of the so-called um, uh, Iraqi style poets such as Jalal al-Din Muhammad Balkhi, Hafiz and Saadi. In Gulshan Enayat letter, for instance, I particularly point to the phrases such as Khalwat Kade Omid, Bayan Shoq. Pardedar Harim Mohabbat, Gul Khandan Chaman Dil Setani, and so on. 
And secondly, the emerging tendencies in the application of not only the vocabulary and concepts, but also the specific types of linguistic compositions that we extensively see in the poetry of the time called the Isfahani or Indian style, as, as one of its titles, a point to which I will return soon. Compositions and concepts such as Khirad Mahal Pasand, Khame Kafid Zaban, Navak Samandud Gham, Majruh Dar Khun Khish Qaltide, Murg Bismil, Dam Gham, Ashk, Hubab, and so on are amongst these and are in many ways unprecedented before the 16th century. This tendency and the abstruseness of the concept and meaning of the linguistic images and the manners by which certain terminologies and typologies are created by the author to shape the letter's form and composition reach an unprecedented degree of deliberate woven complexity, especially in the case of the letters that are communicated between two individuals who both belong to the circle of the tradition of adab, or who may be called literati. Gulshan Enayat is only one example amongst many early modern Persian munsha'at in which we see several examples of correspondence between the elite literati of the time, those whose profession has been tied to the very notion of writing. Terms such as sohandan, which means rhetorician, and qawwas al ma'ani, the diver of the ocean of meaning, are amongst the terms that Enayatullah uses to call the receiver of his letters. In the case of such letters, and by this I refer to the correspondence between two persons of the circle of adab, and compared to the other letters, for example what I showed earlier, here the text becomes even more complex and ornate, full of technical words of the very profession of writing, penmanship, and authorship. To further clarify this point, I refer to three letters by Enayatullah, entitled Bishahbaz Uj Ma'ani, Sarafroz and Juman Sohandani Negoreshyoft, Darchetmat Gavas Lujay Ma'ani Husner Salyoft, and Darchetmat Dus Mehbanu Sahib Sohandan Negoreshyoft. Let's read some parts of these three letters. رشهات خامه انبر فشان نسخه نظیف و رساله لطیفانی آن جادو کلام سحر بیان به سان قطرات نیسان تراوت بخش چمن خاطر این خیرخواه دوستان آمد and so on or this one لعالی متالی و جواهر زواهر فیز که از لجه مواج طبع فیزاگین آن قهرمان کشور سخندانی نقشبند کارگاه معانی به ساحل وجود افتاده انینامه نامی و صحیفه گرامی در خجسته ترین احیان پرتو وصول انداخته and so on. And this third example. Apart from the extreme complexity of the phrases and sentences and the choice of vocabulary, what is particularly important to note in these letters is the extent to which the author feels an obligation to utilize the terminology that signify and represent the profession of writing. In other words, it is the construction elements and the very components of the act of writing and authorship either its corporealities or the conceptualities that is significant in these texts. The use of terms such as ma'ani, sohandani, khame, nuskhe, risale, jadu kalam, sehr bayan, tasnif, alfaz rangin, nur sham, karname sohan, abyat matin, Sohan, and so on, informs us not only from an emerging tendency, but also a committed effort, an intention of the literary communities of the time in defining a specific subjectivity and a self-sufficient character, not only for the profession of penmanship, but also and more importantly for the very being of the text itself. 
To explain this idea further, I now move to the medium of poetry, and particularly the Isfahani style of poetry, Sabki Isfahani, which was in the form of ghazal and flourished and developed in the Safavid period between early 16th and mid to late 18th century. This style originated from tarz taze which means the fresh style, which represented a form of departure from the Persian poetry of the 15th century and earlier, or what is mainly called the um, Araqi style. tarz taze is mainly and most importantly characterized by fine, exquisite imagery and use of novel topics and complex concepts. Paul Lozensky refers to tarz as a representative of the cutting edge of 17th century poetics. Among several unprecedented characteristics of this style, here I particularly focus on one of the manners by which the text and the very style of the Isfahani poetry starts to develop, define, and manifest an inde independent, self-sufficient, and self-referent identity. The Safavid period poets used the materiality and physicality of poetry to shape their poems. Many poems from this period, for instance, refer to concepts such as paper, book, and binding. Only as one example, I refer to the term shiraze, or shiraze kardan, which means um, the stitching of the book binding, which appears several times in uh, Saeb's poems, and Saeb is uh, an important 17th century poet of the tarz taze And also in the poems of the other poets of the style, too. Lozensky, who has discussed this particular topic in different occasions, has found almost 200 uses for this term in the Divan of Saeb. Not only the materiality of poetry, but also the conceptualities that constitute the very act of poetry are obviously and obsessively focused upon in the poetry of the period. The Isfahani style is characterized by direct references to the terms such as ghazal, mesra, which means half couplet, and bait, couplet, which was almost unprecedented before the 16th century. For example, Saeb says, in a half couplet, a distinct half couplet exhibits itself in the ghazal. Or in another, Mesra says, a distinct half couplet would never be forgotten. The frequency of use of novel terms such as Pish Mesra Rasandan and Mesra Abe Mesra Rasandan further illustrates the centrality of technical detail in the poetry of the period. It is crucially important to note that in addition to the materiality and conceptuality of the poetry, style is a structural condition that the Isfahani poetry is aware of. Saeb, for example, in several instances in his poems explicitly points to his tarz, which means style, uses this specific word and associates himself and some other poets of the time with tarz taze. Safavid chronicles of the 17th century, too, use the term tarz taze to refer to the specific type of poetry of the time. What I'm trying to argue here is that while in the binary set of oral language and text, text has traditionally been regarded as secondary to speech, text in the poetry and prose of the Safavid period has its own system, which is not inferior to the spoken word. Safavid texts confidently refer to their own identity and constituents, namely the fresh style, pen, paper, page, letter, word, transcript, half couplet and couplet, which are the absolute heroes of the written realm. Now let's go back to the prose literature of the time. In a majmua of the Ensha compositions, mainly by the well-known late 16th, early 17th century Safavid scholar and author Nasirai Hamedani, copied in late 17th, early 18th century and currently housed at Bodleian's special collection, in a preface that Nasira has written to Mirza Nizam's Bayaz, the text perfectly represents the characteristics of the Safavid Tarasul.
As you see, Nasiro's text is filled with and is in fact shaped around the components, constituents, and mm. construction elements of the practice of writing and profession of authorship and penmanship. Not only in the thematics within the letters, but also as the very title of a letter, in many Anshah collections of the Safavid time, including Nasiray Hamedani's, we see titles such as a letter that is written to request a pair of glasses, or a letter that is written to request ink. It is important to note that the books of Monsha'at had classically very limited space for this category of letters called talab, or iltimasat, meaning requests. In an anonymous monsha'at and a manual on the practice of writing and epistolography called Lataif al which is written in the mid 16th century and copied in 1652 and is now at the Bodleian Special Collection, in a section which is dedicated to the category of iltimasat, personal requests, the only sample letter included in the book is one that is written to a person to request a copy of the well-known text, Akhlaq al-Nasiri. As I mentioned before, each monsha'at had very few letter samples at each section, and the fact that in the case of Lataif al the only sample in the request section is a text asking for a book, or in the case of many other monsha'at, we see several samples of requests for ink or a pair of glasses, sheds light on the fundamentally important role that ideas and concepts associated with the profession of writing played in the society. The extensive presence and obsessive focus on such topics related to the act of writing and the performance of authorship, either in the form of poetry or prose, conveys the significance of what may be literally called the Safavid text and textuality. In other words, the high frequency of such titles in the poetry and the Munshaat prose of the time departs from what may be interpreted as simple fantasia or in some cases practical matters and starts to operate as a mechanism of fashioning and fetishizing the act of writing and more importantly the written form, namely the text itself. This simultaneous concentration on an obsession with the very textuality and the shared thematics and concepts in the poetry and prose of the Safavids leads us to rethink some of the boundaries that we draw between these two media and the isolated manners in which we study each medium regardless of the other. Going back to Nasirai Hamedani's Monsha'at in a letter under the title of A Text Written to a Dear One, Nasira writes, سانیان عبارتی که در این اوان به اصفهان فرستاده بودند و امر عالی به حل آن شرف صدور یافته بود مع انها فیها ما فیها متمه انظار گشته رساله در حل آن تحریر یافته و شجره مبارکه موسوم شده امید که سمره بر آن مترتب گردد همانا که چون به نظر عالی درآید سیاق کلام و اسلوب خاص و طرز تازه آن مطبوع طبع انور گردد here Nasira uses the term Tarz Taze, the fresh style, for the prose literature of the time, a term mainly associated with and known for the emerging style of poetry of the time. We saw previously in this paper the clear reference to the term Tarz Taze, the fresh style, in the poetry of the time. As I mentioned earlier, Safavid chronicles of the 17th century use the term tarz taze to refer to the specific type of poetry of the time. Sa'ib too declares that his and Talib Amuli's poetry belongs to tarz taze In the case of Nasiraz in Shapros, who himself, like many other characters of the Safavid community of Adab, was both a poet and a munshi, prose composer, the application of the same term, namely tarz taze to his ensha, blurs the boundaries between poetry and prose and contextualizes the ensha literature in the broader literary canon of the time, namely the highly complex textuality of the Safavids. In 
In the introduction of Bodleian's anonymous Monshaat of the mid-16th century, to which I referred earlier, the author writes about the profession of Kitabat, writing, and who a true Kateb, Kateb is, is, a, is a type of prose writer, and who a true Kateb is. The author believes that a true author is that who takes a meaning, then transforms it through the language in a way that when people read it, each can confirm that they had this idea in their mind, but they were unable to put it in words so accurately and eloquently. This rhetorical eloquence, or what is called fesahat wa belagat, is one of the most important aspects associated with Arabic and Persian poetry. Interestingly, the author continues with saying that Mutanabbi, the well-known Arab poet, had such eloquence for which he was called Mutanabbi. So here the author is fully aware of drawing parallels between poetry and prose. Also, where he describes what a good text is, he points to its interpretiveness, which he defines as clarity of expression of seemingly simple topics in a different manner and accompanied by multiple horizons of meaning. This definition well accords with the concept of nazo khiali, which means exquisite imagery. As an important branch of tarz taze poetry, and in fact the poetry of the Isfahani style. The style of nazo khiali, exquisite imagery, emerged in 17th century Iran, especially Isfahan, and then spread to India and is based on creating novel topics and unprecedented concepts in poetry. It is concerned with incorporating detailed aspects of everyday life into poetry in a novel way that has never been used before and to evoke the reader's imagination in an extreme manner. Naziri Neshaburi, Talib Amuli, Kalim Kashani, and Sa'ib Tabrizi are amongst the most important poets of this style. To show what we exactly mean by the exquisite imagery of the tarz taze let's read a couplet by Sa'ib. Agar bar roze husn to zambur asal uftad, gulab az abr mi barad zedud sham ta mahshar. If we translate the couplet word by word, it would be something like this sentence. If a honeybee sits on the garden of your beauty, rose water will sputter from the cloud, from the smoke of the candle forever. This meaning, however, seems vague, and it's not easily possible to draw connections between the concepts of honeybee, rose water, cloud, and candle smoke in the couplet. But let's decode Sa'ib's couplet through imagination. Imagine a honeybee sitting on the garden of the beauty of the beloved and eats from it and then makes honey and then one day a candle is made from that honey and then sometime later that candle is burnt so its smoke goes to the air and makes a cloud and then it rains the effect of the extreme beauty of the beloved on whom that honeybee sat one day is so strong that rose water will spatter from the cloud of the smoke of the candle forever. This couplet by Sa'eb is a perfect example to illustrate the extreme fascination of the poets of the tarz taze and Isfahani style with the creation of complex, exquisite, and novel concepts and images out of everyday life and seemingly routine topics. The complexity of such novel topics in many cases turns the poem into a form of riddle that is to be decoded. In two couplets by Talib Amuli, the late 16th, early 17th century poet, we read Beruye balish har lafzi az oraq divanash sar julide sad lobat mahmur ra didam cho kardam dide ra barik bin dar diqqat fikrash khiyal junbesh mojgan chashm mur ra didam which means on the pillow of each word from the pages of his poetry book I saw the straggly heads of a hundred sleepy, beautiful, beloved ones. As I narrowed down in his accurate thoughts, 
I saw the illusion of the ants' eyes blinking with their eyelashes. Talib creates an extremely complex, even fictional image in which each word of a poetry book is imagined as a pillow on which there are a hundred of heads of beauties. And then if one looks closer at each small head, they will see their extremely small eyes that are blinking with their eyelashes. Through this image, one can now imagine a whole poetry book as it is made of thousands of beloved heads each with their eyes blinking, therefore the creation of the bizarre image of billions of tiny eyes constantly blinking and looking at you while you read a divan. Such poetic constructs, based on close attention to the details of simple objects, were referred to at the time as ma'ani bigane or ma'ani gharib, which means strange or alien concepts, and mazmun bandi, which means the creation or elaboration of the meaning, and were very common in the poetry of the Safavid period. The creation of alien concepts and images through the use of language was so important at the time that there are several couplets in which poets, as part of their contemporary fascination with the use of the constructing elements of the profession of writing in their poems, to which I referred earlier, explicitly refer to the two fundamental elements of poetry at the time, namely laughs or surat and ma'ni, which means word and meaning, that represented the poem's outer and inner beings. In fact, the creation of novel meanings in the poetry of the period became so central that it led in the discourse of the community of adibs to a form of dichotomy between the word and meaning. Amongst many of such couplets, for example, Sa'eb says, you and I are physically distant, not by heart. Our distance is like the distance between two half couplets in a couplet. Or says in another couplet, meaning ascends to the sky by the help of light-hearted words. Polished words are like the wings of the eagle, the, the eagle of the meaning. This dichotomy between the concepts of word and meaning was in many ways the result of the fetishized obsession with the creation of alien and far-fetched concepts that in some cases led to poems that were almost impossible to comprehend or decode and were in fact a site of showcasing the mastery of the poet in the use of poetic technicality. Now let's go back to Nasira Hamedani's Munshaat. Nasira too, on a preface to a sharh on Anvari's Divan, writes, خدای را سپاس که چون لفظ پرستان معنی ناشناس متا روی دست لوح و قلم را سرمایه دکان خودفروشی نساختم و به میانجی صلح حق و باطل طرح آشتی نینداخته. تکلف را بر من به سوزن نتوان دوخت و ساختگی را به رشته بر من نتوان بست. شاباش عیب نکنم و تحسین بیجا نکنم. He again, in another letter, uses the terms الفاظ تازه و معانی بکر, which means the new words and unprecedented meanings, and makes a reference to the term tarze taze, although to refer to God and what he created. In another letter again to a friend, Nasira refers to the common literary tradition of the time in which devising difficult terms, ebarat bigane, and fake expressions of love through poems, shayrhay ashqane, is a proof of the mastery of penmanship and the very profession of writing. Or 
We previously saw in Nasira's preface on Divan Anbari's share the application of terms such as takalluf and sahtegi, which mean abstruseness, artificiality, and pretension to refer to the textual productions and literary vibe of the time through which it has been common for the authors to exhibit their expertise through the use of far-fetched words and phrases and devising complex concepts that are not easy to understand. Nasira then continues that this obsession with the use of extraordinary words and concepts may lead to exaggerated and fake expressions of admiration of the person to whom the letter is written. In another letter to a friend, Nasira swears by the word and meaning, laughs va ma'ni, and then clearly refers to the literary exaggeration and poetical hyperbole, اغراغات منشیانه و مبالغات شاعرانه, in emphasizing that this letter, unlike what is normally written in letters, is a genuine expression and not an artificial textual production. It is also important to note that here Nasira combines the prose and poetry of the time and points to the same problematic quality in both in the contemporary practices of literature. Moving to another significant manuscript at the Bodleian Special Collection, an Ensha Majmura of the Safavid period compiled by an anonymous person, most probably in the mid to late 17th century, and containing a set of important chancellery and non-chancellery epistles, also sample letters and stock phrases. In two letters from Shamsuddin Muhammad Sajjasi, a well-known scholar of the time, to an unnamed high rank friend, and also in the reply to these letters, the texts in large parts manifest the significance of the very act of writing and profession of authorship, complaining about the writing trend of the time, which is based on banal abstruseness and verbosity, takalluf and etnab, and the appreciation of simultaneous brevity, ijaz, and complexity of text. In one part of the reply to Sajjasi's letter, we read, Maktub Sharif ke rahat ruh mashub an bud khandam va dar ibda' alfaz o ejaz maani an wale o mutahayir bemand, and so on. Reference to ibda' alfaz, inventing new words or terms, and ejaz maani the marvels of complex concepts and meanings, once again reminds us of the medium of poetry and what is called mazmuna farini, the creation and elaboration of meaning, as one of the most significant and central characteristics of the tarz taze and the Isfahani style. These types of descriptions may well help us to imagine the literary atmosphere of the time and the emerging hard and intense competition amongst the men of pen, either poets or prose composers, each trying to defeat the other by devising more intricacy and mystery in the text, even at the cost of sacrificing the meaning or at least the clarity of meaning. Those to whom Nasira refers as lafs parastan ma'ani nashanas, those who are passionate about form but pay no care to the meaning. After reviewing the stylistic tendencies in the poetry and prose of the time and in such a literary context, finding some extreme and most bizarre cases of the complexity of form and consequently meaning in Safavid literature will no longer be surprising. The long tradition of composing texts, mainly poetry, only through the use of dotless letters, called qayramangut or binuqat. With its early examples attributed to Imam Ali, also an important one by Jami, called Divan binuqat from the 15th century, reached its peak in the Safavid period and continued towards the Qajars and the contemporary time.
In the Ghayr Mangut practice in Persian, to compose a text, the author has only 15 out of 32 letters of the alphabet. Therefore, it's an extremely difficult and slow practice, and the author must have an almost impossible to achieve comprehensive knowledge of the Persian and Arabic vocabulary and adjacency of words in order to be able to find alternative words and phrases so to avoid the dotted words and compositions in the text. In such a scenario, the alternative terms, namely the Qayramangut ones, are in most cases totally far-fetched, ponderous and cumbersome. While due to the difficulty of the practice there are not many Qayramangut examples, as such technique there are two letters in the previously mentioned Enayatullah's Munsha'at of Gulshan Enayat at the Bodleian Collection. The first letter is entitled Sadru Sudur Mamalik Mahruse, and the second one is Hella Araya Arus Vedad Masare Sedad. I have included a few lines here from the second letter, and you can indeed see that as one of the most bizarre types of textual abstruseness and alienness, how extremely difficult and in some parts impossible to comprehend the text becomes. Interestingly, we see that an owner of the book has attached the meaning of several words between the lines, which shows how severely painful understanding the text has been, even at a time relatively close to its production. Another important aspect about the Qayr Mangut writing practice is that not only the content, but also the form, and the very visuality of the text is unfamiliar to the reader's eyes. Apart from the meaning, it's the text's look and appearance that is most cumbersome, alien and mysterious to the reader. The purpose of which is perhaps for most the manifestation of the composer's extreme mastery of the profession of authorship and extraordinary powers. The text in such a scenario is no longer only a medium of the transfer of meaning, but also and more importantly, the goal of writing itself. Rather than the words, their choices and their form being in the service of meaning, it is the meaning that is in the service of the words, their choices and their forms, or namely the manners of impressing the reader in intense ways. In this case, the signifier becomes more important than its classic associated signified, and as a consequent, the text as signifier turns into the signified itself, as it first and foremost refers to and signifies itself rather than the associative meanings, creating a hypertext that is highly ponderous and even a self-sufficient animal rather than a dependent product. These emerging approaches towards textuality and the manners by which topics such as al malhuruf letterism, Islamic letterism, became extremely popular during the Safavid period, also the extension of the 14th and 15th centuries movements such as Hurufiye and Nuqtaviye may all be seen in resonance with each other and as a continuum. To go further, in a letter that is one of the most spectacular examples of ornate Safavid epistolography written from Abdul Hussein Nasiri Tusi to Mir Muhammad Hussein Tafrishi, the letter begins with this couplet. Name man miravad nazdik dost, kashki man name khud budami. Which means, my letter will go to my beloved. I wish I was my letter. In this prosimetrum, and prosimetrum is a prose text that contains passages of verse at significant moments of the narrative. Nasiriya Tusi commences the letter with this couplet, pinpointing the crucial significance of the message within the couplet. Nasiri in this couplet creates a form of dichotomy between the composer and the composed, but also, and more importantly, personifies the letter as a being that is now the subject of the composer's envy, implying the text's significance, the text who is now in control of Nasiriya Tusi and his emotions, not the other way around. While Nasiriya's couplet may be interpreted as an axiomatic expression of the author's wish to reach his dear friend, 
or beloved, there are several other instances in the Safavid Ekhwani and Sultani epistolography in which the author firstly refers to the concept of a letter and secondly applies to it the figure of personification. These concepts have been so extensively used in the Safavid and consequently the Qajar literature that have even entered the contemporary folk language of Iranians. To continue this topic, I refer again to the Bodleian's anonymous monsha'at of the mid-16th century. In a sample letter to a governor, and this is in the section of Sultaniyat, but very close to the Ikhwani epistles format. We read this couplet. Murghiz Astane Mashur Nam Nam Ahmad be nazd Ashir Mahjur o Mustaham, which means a bird who was called Letter from the place of the beloved came to the abandoned restless lover. What is particularly notable in this couplet is the novel personification metaphor, what is called tashbih tashkhisi, that is applied to it. While the concept of receiving a letter from a beloved has a long history in Persian ghazal poetry, and the idea is used extensively by many, almost all poets of the so-called Araqi style, such as Jalaluddin Muhammad Balkhi and Hafiz, and here I have included parts of one of such ghazals by Hafiz. In most of these cases, the letter is the object rather than the subject of the sentence. In other words, it is treated by the poet as a thing written by the beloved or lover and rarely reaches a degree of significance higher than that. The letter in the Araqi style is in most cases something secondary a dependent object that is attached to a messenger, human or bird, so to reach the receiver. The Safavid literature, however, shifts the agency of letter from an object to the subject, seeing it as a being to be envied by the author of the letter itself, or as a bird that can fly itself and reach the recipient with the help of no messenger. In other words, the concept of epistle and the profession of epistolography in the Safavid period conveys multiple layers of awareness of the author and of the importance of the agency of text and textuality as a highly operative, self-sufficient system, an independent being rather than the author's product or even byproduct. While several scholars of the Safavid Tarasol interpret it as a period of literary dilemma, and do not consider the Safavid prose literature as an independent style, but an extension to the previous structures of epistolography, it is crucially important to study the Safavid monsha'at not in a vacuum, but in the broader literary context of the time, such as poetry. Safavid and Shah has its own stylistic specificities, as that of the tarz taze and the Isfahani style, with its own particular characteristics that marks it different to the previous Araqi style. While the consistency and cohesiveness of sources of poetry, their popularity and wide circulation has led to the possibility and feasibility of scholarly attention to and concentration on making distinguishment between the medieval and early modern Persian poetry, this has not been the case for the currents of prose, especially the less popular genre of epistolography. In fact, instead of considering the phenomenon of Safavid Tarasol as a dilemma, if the totality of the textual productions of the time, including poetry and prose, is examined in parallel and contextualized in a resonating manner, layers of hidden topography of social psychology of text and textuality would start to appear that are normatively invisible through the lens of single disciplinarity. Text in the Safavid period starts to release itself from the traditional bounds of oral language and defines itself as a self-sufficient being, independent from other related phenomena, even from the author. This may firstly exhibit itself in the clear manifestations and reference to the components and constructing elements of text and the act of penmanship, such as style, pen, 
paper, page, binding, couplet, half couplet, and so on. Secondly, in the confidence of the composer of the text in elaborating on the highly abstruse forms and content of such texts. Thirdly, in the self-sufficiency of the composed text from the author of the text. And ultimately, in the dominance of the text over the author, text in these scenarios, and when it starts to operate as an independent, standalone system, is not necessarily a medium of denotative meaning, but a set of multiple, even infinite, connotative interpretations and implications. I showed across this paper several instances in which the Safavid authors themselves declare that no absolute trust should be put in the surface layers of the associative meanings of the text. Safavid Tarasol and epistolography as a multi-layered interpretive hypertextual mechanism should not be read as a straightforward one-to-one -one equivalent of the so-called reality. An observation that reduces the highly complex mechanisms of early modern Persian textuality to single meaning narrations. While several Safavid epistles showcase most intense expressions of friendship communicated between the characters of the community of Adibs and literati, contextualizing these concepts and meanings in the larger literary atmosphere of the time and the changing agency of text from a simple signifier to self-reference signifier may help us to understand such texts in a new manner. To conclude and to clarify this point, amongst hundreds of such intensely emotional epistles, let's look at parts of a letter in Bodleian's mid to late 17th century Munshaat, a letter composed by an unknown scholar to Shamseddin Sajjosi, the important Safavid scholar. The letter is a response to Sajjosi's letter and as appears in Sajjosi's text, the author of this text might also be one of the important and high rank scholars of the time. Safine Sine Dar Garga Be Feraq Uftade Nejat Hazan Mongate Be Abgine Yamal Bar Sang Hijran Amade Tamae Tadaro Kazan Mutajassim چه جای صبر است و هنگام شکی بایی؟ تا این قایت اگر وقتی تسکینی به مسکن این دل مسکین می رسید و راحتی به ساحت جان بیتاقت نزول می کرد آن نبود مگر از اثر آن که مجلس عالی وعده داده بود که مدتی شطرنج فضل و رقعه آن بقعه خواهیم باخت و یک چندی راهوار فساحت در مزمار آن دیار خواهیم تاخت And so on. While understanding the intensity of emotions communicated through the letter might not be easy first, if we contextualize such expressions of emotion and affection in the literary canon of the Safavids, the text will possibly reveal other aspects of it that are hidden at the beginning. I try to argue across this paper that the literature of the Safavids in both genre of poetry and prose operate through a system that is obsessively engaged with the creation of elaborate, unprecedented meanings. This can best be seen in the nazo khiali, exquisite imagery, of the tarz taze which finds its way to the prose literature of the time, and similar to poetry, makes a later transformation to bizarre and exaggerated forms of complexity and artificiality of language that the Safavid authors, too, complain about. This fetishized obsession with text changes the meaning of it from a device of transfer of meaning to the ultimate goal of writing itself. In such a scenario, and in the extreme examples of firstly the Tarzetaze poetry that are mainly represented in the later um, Indian branch, and secondly most of the body of Safavid epistolography, both courtly and friendly, Rather than the author's or the reader's state, what is called hall, it is the text itself that comes to the forefront of the act of authorship, 
The author's association with the text is not necessarily to express his state of being, but more importantly to express the reader in its most intense way. Therefore, the text, in the extreme cases of the poetry and prose of this period, is an outward rather than inward practice. As I mentioned earlier, Eltemasat, Dar Arz Eltemas, or Dar Talab, is an important category of the Ikhwani epistolography of the Safavid and is dedicated to a type of friendly and personal letters in which a request is put forth by the author of a letter. A request that could be asking to receive a copy of Akhlaq Nasiri, a pair of glasses, ink, or even begging a friend to come for a visit, all cases to which I referred earlier. The existence of this genre and many Safavid sample letters with a clear demarcation of type compared to the previous Timurid epistles illustrates the formulaic and heavily plotted context in which the act of creative authorship took place during the Safavid period. Therefore, it's extremely important to consider the specific manners of operation of the Safavid act of authorship and mechanisms of textuality while reading these monsha'at, the manners of operation that are in many ways performative rather than informative. A performativity that is a key characteristic of the later radical sub-branches of the tarz taze poetry and the deep fetishized obsession of the community of adibs with Mazmun Afarini, creation of elaborate meanings. This obsession with and strict commitment to the rules and codes of the Safavid practice of adab may be interpreted as systems that function within the text as self-control mechanisms, transforming the text from a straightforward traditional hasbahal, self-reflection, to a fully tailored, self-fashioned and politicized being. In such a condition, the text departs from mere representations of the state of being and the single meaning socio-historicity that starts and then starts to operate as a presentation of text itself and the phenomenology of textual dynamics in resonance with the character of the fully professional Safavid author with all its multiple layers of connotation. Analyzing the poetry and prose of the time in parallel and release from the disciplinary bounds facilitates understanding this meandering act of de- and re-territorialization of text that emerged from the new ontological and methodological milieu of early modern Iran. Thank you.